Hello and greetings. Welcome back from lunch break. I hope you all had uh, took some time uh, to pull yourselves together. I'm so excited to introduce this panel on analog digital hybridity. Um, I think theorizing the analog and theorizing the digital are two of the most exciting things we can talk about. And just to give a little background, little little known background on things like the analog, not many people know it, but one of the first popularizations of the term uh, came from the analog science fiction magazine, which I always think was interesting because it was meant to be a magazine of analog simulations of science fiction ideas instead of and this is the 1950s computer simulations of these ideas, right? So the idea is that you build these paper machines through uh, narrative story writing uh, to tell this sort of analog story to do this thought experiment that you couldn't uh, wire simulations to do. So anyways, it's got this deep storied history and I'm really excited to talk uh, through this today uh, with our four amazing panelists, Jack Murray, Merrick Stoley, Paul Booth, and Melissa Rogerson. Unfortunately, Melissa could not make it today. Um, so she has given us a video, which I will play first. Um, but she says that she will try to get into the Discord later. If anyone has any questions, just please leave them in the panel space of the Discord and we can um, have that conversation there. All right, so uh, Melissa, I'm just gonna introduce Melissa and then I'll play the video and then we'll move through the panel. First, it will be Merrick, uh, then Paul, and then last but not least, Jack. Um, Melissa Rogerson uh, is a lecturer in human computer interaction in the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne. Her research examines the experience of playing tabletop games in both physical and digital forms and the use of digital tools for the tabletop gameplay, as well as the characteristics and motivations of hobbyist players, designers, and developers. And so Melissa has given us this fine recording, so we'll just hop into it and enjoy. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Melissa Rogerson, I'm from the University of Melbourne in Australia and I'm presenting some research that I've done with my colleagues Lucy Sparrow, also from the University of Melbourne, and John Banks from Queensland University of Technology. Apologies that we can't be with you in person today, but these are the tyrannies of time zones. Um, we do look forward, though, to engaging with you about this paper and, of course, about the other great papers that are being presented here, just maybe not at 4am our time. So in this presentation, we're revisiting a bit of an old trope of game studies and one that's almost passe to many researchers. But we want to go back and think about how the concept of the magic circle can be productive for our understanding of gameplay practices and particularly in the tabletop and board gaming space. We see tabletop gaming as a fundamentally social and cooperative process, even when the games themselves are competitive. So in Richard Sennett's book Together, which in some ways inspired this paper, he defines cooperation dryly, he says, as an exchange in which the participants benefit from the encounter. Sennett goes on to talk about cooperation in games, although he mainly talks about it in the context of children's play. And he notes, and I've also engaged with this idea in some detail, that the requirement for cooperation doesn't rule out a competitive element and so there we get this quote from one of my interviewees that we're not helping each other to win but we're helping each other to play to make someone win. Thank you Melissa. So one of the aspects I think that's fascinating about thinking about magic circles um, in general is the social construction of the uh, of what they are, of what's permitted, of um, what's inside and outside that circle, and that's a process, quite a complex process actually, a nuanced. Um, it's a social process in which there's feedback and negotiation around um, what can occur within that space and how to navigate and negotiate it amongst players. And I actually think one of the really rich aspects of that that we, we are thinking about in, in our presentation and paper today, and in which in fact Lucy will speak on in a much more detail in a moment, is that this has an ethical, as a deep ethical aspect to it. But one of the things we're thinking about here in that ethical sense is what gets included in these spaces 
and what practices or people are excluded as, as well. So if you can think about it in, in terms of a, a basic board game set up, you have your table, you have your players around the table and you have your pieces. And there's a lot of negotiation and discussion around how that session is going to play out, um, what the house rules are, um, debates and discussions about interpretations of rules, even about who gets to set the pieces up. So I think an interesting aspect there is how different play groups um, might negotiate that process differently and experience that differently. So basically, just to summarise there, we, we think that thinking through how those decisions and practices are negotiated, how those decisions are made is an important part of thinking through social, thinking through, sorry, magic circles as social practices. And again, this is just going back to where these ideas come from. And there's not a lot of time in our presentation today to go through the full history of how these ideas of magic circles have been taken up in the broad field of game studies. Obviously, it goes back to Pusinger's work um, in Homo Ludens and talking about magic circle very much as being about a, a place, a bounded place. That's been explored further by game scholars like um, Katie Zimmerman, Katie, Katie Salem and Eric Zimmerman and many others. Um, and it's been much debated as to whether this idea, in fact, for a period, should even have um, much traction in the field of game studies to understand games because there was views that it was kind of becoming quite a formalist understanding of what's inside a game and what's not. And there were concerns that that formalist approach perhaps could um, perhaps not pay enough attention to the, the social construction and social practices around what constitutes a magic circle. And I think we move beyond that a little bit now. We can kind of park those concerns and move on to considering magic circles and their, and their diversity from how they're enacted and experienced and materialised, whether that's in board games or video games, or even the hybridity of the two that we'll get onto. So one of the important ideas, going back to Wiesinger, right back to 1955, and again, I'm not gonna read through this slide in detail, is that magic circles really are places, right? They're a demarked place physically. And board games, of course, are very open to that. Perhaps that's one of the problems somewhat with applying the idea of a magic circle to a board game, right? Because you have this demarked place, literally a table, often which people are sitting around with a, with a board on it, with pieces. So it's a quite ritualistically demarked space or area that, that players are sitting out and inhabiting and experiencing together. Yeah, thank you, John. So, yeah, going back again to, I mean, John's already just covered a lot of this, but there is also, beyond this idea of understanding the magic circle as a place, there is this sense that it is a social setting. So it's anywhere, physical or not, that where people come together and they really negotiate the rules and behaviors um, that pertain to the gaming experience, to the play experience. And, you know, we have um, some different we have Fine here who, who talked about how there are three different kinds of knowledge that players bring to the game. We have Conway and Trevelyan um, who talk about these different kinds of worlds that we understand that we can enter into when we play. Um, but without going into too much detail there, really the key thing is that it takes effort to operate in the world of game rules or in the player character's fantasy world, right? There is this distinct effort that, that comes about when we come together and we negotiate this play process. This is really important as well because, um, as John already pointed out, there are ethical implications to the ways that we negotiate these rules. Um, coming from some of my other research on ethics and multiplayer games, right, there's this sort of sense from a lot of players who play digital multiplayer games that there is an ethical magical circle. So they draw this boundary around what's acceptable or not acceptable in games and kind of, you know, push out real world concerns or real world ethical concerns and say, hey, what goes on in this gaming space? And it's not just necessarily in the game either, as John pointed out to me earlier, in any kind of game related space. So for instance, a gaming convention and sort of say, hey, what we do here, 
we have our own rules and we have our own ways of doing things and real world or outside ethics don't necessarily apply. So really there's this understanding here of the magic circle as something that both can keep things out, but it can also keep things in. Um, and this is really, we think, a useful way of understanding the magic circle because it really highlights how there are so many different ways that players can construct these magic circles. Um, and there's so many different functions that these constructions can have. So it can be great to draw a magic circle to maintain a illusory attitude, for instance, and to create a supportive play environment. But it can also kind of have these toxic effects as well, where certain people are excluded or, you know, the maintenance of toxic behaviors. And it's here that some of the scholarship really tries to distinguish digital gameplay from tabletop play. So, you know, some might argue that a digital game already does some of the work of drawing a magic circle for the players. Um, whereas in a tabletop game, really, you know, when the players come together, they're creating and maintaining the rules um, through or as part of the social setting. Um, so what's interesting here is, you know, not necessarily, let's say, <laughs> board games versus video games at all, you know, what's different about them, um, but looking at how players can negotiate and contest and explore the idea of an inclusive magic circle, both in video games and in tabletop games. In discussion of that social setting and collaborative work, we often look at the role of the game and of the player, but we think that it's appropriate here and obviously as um, Salen and Zimmerman did in Rules of Play, to acknowledge the role of the designer and of the work that they do to establish and enable um, a particular setting. And, you know, guided by, by Mia Consalvo, we also looked at Constance Steinkuhler's mangle of play, we actually found examples of where that, that opposition or that relationship between the designer and the player is actually cooperative. Um, so, for example, in Power Grid Recharged, which is a, a revision of the sort of classic 2004 board game, um, some of the player conventions like standing houses on one end to show that a player's turn hadn't yet been finalised have actually been written into the rules of the game. So that's part of this kind of ongoing dialogue between players, between player groups and between players and designers as well um, to set those boundaries. And the last of these really widely accepted um, conceptualizations of a magic circle is this idea that um, there's a bubble that surrounds a person and keeps them in a playful state of mind, which of course comes back to that illusory attitude that Bernard Suits talks about, making the choice to play, making the choice to follow the rules of the game. We've talked a lot about different conceptualizations of the magic circle. As John said, we know that there's been a strong reaction against the magic circle. There's kind of been a reaction against the reaction as well. Um, uh, but we only have 15 minutes. So we want to acknowledge that we're aware of that, but then kind of move on to how can we use that productively. And a novel take that we found on the magic circle is this idea that it might be entirely individual so that any magic circle that we form is kind of a Venn diagram of all of our magic circles. And of course, this can also apply in a group context, right? It might not be individual players. It might be group one, group two, group three, um, who bring their expectations, their mores, their tropes, their, their play styles into other settings, for instance, um, conventions, game stores, or even kind of online environments. And we feel that this is quite an oppositional approach to, um, to creating a magic circle. Uh, rather than creating similarities, you're sort of hunting for similarities with this idea that people's um, attitudes or the group's attitudes are fixed and they're not willing to, to have any give or take. Um, and we really feel that that give and take is absolutely perhaps at the heart of a, of a constructive dialogue. And perhaps this oppositionality is what leads to those kind of you're playing it wrong arguments um, where sometimes you don't even need to be playing the game to have those arguments and discussions.
Wow, wingspan. So you can talk about this aspect of establishing how, how players build and establish the sense of a magic circle through many games. But wingspan's a game that's fascinated me in the last um, few years, designed by Elizabeth Hargraves, published by Stonemaier Games. It's been, been quite a popular game. It's got quite a lot of attention. Um, it's often described as a, a card-driven engine-building game. It's a, a viewed as a, somewhat a medium-weight game in terms of complexity and rules, et cetera. But I think that um, one of the aspects of, of it that's fascinating is the pieces are beautiful. The aesthetics are gorgeous of the pieces. It's not incredibly complicated to play. It invites people in with this experience of collecting birds. So it has this ecological theme. So the theme invites players in. What's interested me is how players navigate that experience of collaboratively creating the magic circle experience of this gorgeous game and, and how it invites you in with the, the colorful eggs, as you see there, the beautiful cards. What card set do you play with? What, what um, region of the world are you collecting these birds from? Um, and negotiating out amongst players with the dynamics of the game, what play strategy you're pursuing without trying to cut out other people's enjoyment of the game, right? And it becomes almost a collaborative, cooperative, semi-competitive dance. Right? And different play groups will negotiate and navigate that experience of how competitive it might be versus how cutthroat, or sorry, cutthroat it might be versus how it was more of a collaborative experience um, very differently. And that fascinates me of how that magic circle, if you like, will be negotiated and navigated and experienced by different play groups in just a single game such as such as this, such as um, Wingspan. So, but it's just one of many games I think in which um, as a board game can reveal how players, different players, different play groups experience and establish cooperatively and even competitively the sense of a magic circle. And that takes us to witches. <laughs> so that's maybe a bit of a, another left turn here. We're taking you on a kind of a roller coaster ride, but we really want to highlight this idea that um, you know, the more we thought about the magic circle in these ways, the more parallels we saw with witches and literally the magic circles that, you know, Heisinger was referring to when he was using this, this term, um, these, this idea that witches work together to kind of form a circle within which, you know, the magic can happen, right? And, but what we've not seen made explicit is the sense that, you know, it's this, a circle that is created to keep certain practices in, right? And also to keep things out, to keep the mundane world out. And also importantly, sustaining that circle takes a lot of effort and will and mutual co cooperation between everyone present. You know, when we look at the words he, he, here on the screen that which is used to invoke these circles, we can really see that they speak to the ideas of the magic circle as a place of connection, of cooperation, of keeping things out, keeping things in, um, and of there being a sort of prescribed set of behaviors that applies to our interactions in these circles. And of course, that ties back as well to what John was saying about the importance of artifacts as well. You know, certain artifacts belong in this magic circle in the same way that certain artifacts belong in the play magic circle as well. And drawing that analogy back to gaming, you know, we see within this magic circle a space that's created for play and also by play at the same time. Because this is a session on hybridity, we want to add some considerations here around sort of digital tools and that combination of digital tools and traditional tabletop games. And this really connects to these two papers, which have come out of the work that Lucy and I are doing with Martin Gibbs as well, and with the support of Game In Lab. Um, one of these is published already, but you have to wait for Kai Play for the other one, <clears throat> or send us an email. Um, so in our paper that came out of a series of interviews with game designers, 
one of the things we found was that many of those designers, just like players, have really strong views about the role of technology in their games. And one of the things that sort of came up was this idea that technologies, right, using your mobile phone, um, using computers, using tablets, may make those boundaries of play or of the magic circle more porous. Um, so, for example, a game session that requires a mobile phone as part of play can be interrupted when that phone performs its real world function of being a phone, of receiving messages of some kind or calls. The second thing that we found that's really interesting is this idea of longevity. So we play games with people, we build rituals over time with people, and those rituals are all often tied to artefacts. Um, lots of people talk about, you know, I have my grandmother's copy of a particular game, or I, I was given this game by a friend, or I first played this game by a friend. And um, the, the age of the artefact is tied to its kind of value or perceived value to the player and hybridity can disrupt that because people tend to see hybrid tools digital tools in general as ephemeral rather than having that connection to that long history of play and of practices and the third point that we wanted to make here is that hybridity can also add new constraints um, new restrictions for example, if you want to play a game at a convention um, in, in a large room full of people, you might have trouble if you're listening to a game that requires you to listen to particular sounds. Um, unlike witches, right, who can create their magic circle anywhere, unlike other forms of a tabletop game which you can play in a busy cafe at a convention, wherever. So we're really sorry once again that we can't be with you in real time today. It's 4 a.m. in Australia. Um, I included a picture there because I um, managed to break my leg after some fairly spectacular non-Olympic gymnastics. Um, so my painkillers and my cat and I are probably sound asleep and I hope John and, and Lucy are too. Um, but we're on the Discord and you can reach us by Twitter or by email as well. And we would really love to hear from you. We're looking forward to seeing as much of this conference as we can. Thanks very much. See you later. Thanks, Melissa. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. I'm here in, in, in Brisbane under COVID lockdown. So. <laughs> All right, thank you, Melissa, John, and Lucy for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think you can all see from the chat um, how exciting that was. Um, all right, moving on, uh, we have, uh, please correct me if I'm, uh, please correct me if I'm mispronouncing your name, but Merrick Stoli. Yep, that's right, yeah. Um, Merrick is a lecturer at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he teaches students in both the computer science, computer game design, and the art and design games and playable media programs. As a researcher, he explores the relationships between digital and analog objects and spaces, focusing on escape rooms and board games. He's also an avid board game player and has reached shelving capacity in his home to store more games, a problem that probably everybody at this conference has. So uh, please take it away, Merrick. All right. Um, sorry, I've lost the Zoom window. Okay, share my screen. Screen, geez. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Eric Soli. Uh, my presentation is called From Boards and Chits to Circuit Boards and Bits. It is hard for me to say. Um, please excuse the background. I am in my childhood bedroom. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so, uh, sorry, this is going to be a formal analysis of the spectrum between uh, fully analog board games and fully digital board games. And my hope is that this uh, sort of formal work can uh, be used uh, to spark more social, uh, more social and humanistic works in the future uh, in this sort of hybrid space. Um, so as an example, I'm going to be focusing on the game uh, Gloomhaven, uh, which uh, is a massive game. Uh, you can see this game is uh, the box is like, you know, like over a foot long and wide. Uh, it's 21.6 pounds. Um, this is, it's huge. Um, it's huge in terms of uh, box. It's huge in terms of uh, components. So this is a list of all the components in the game. We have hundreds of cards, um, figures, uh, you know, all sorts of, of, of bits and pieces, the miniatures. Um, <laughs> this game is, is ridiculously large. And it's also ridiculously large in terms of rules. Um, so this game, uh, the rule book is about 50 pages long, which is, you know, not the longest uh, game uh, rule book in the world, but it, it's quite long. 
Um, and uh, sorry, I should I should explain that this is a dungeon crawling uh, game. Uh, it's a cooperative legacy game. So it uh, you play this through a campaign um, of up to 95 scenarios long, each of which will take you around 60, 120 minutes. Um, so uh, it's yeah, it's it's long in terms of length. It's long in terms of uh, it's it's quite difficult to learn. Um, well, I, I don't. It's it's heavy. There's lots of rules going on there. So this is a very complex um, and large game in many ways. Um, and if you want to play the game, it might be yeah. So Jaws of the Lion is a little more approachable. Um, that's a recent re-release of the game. That's a little simple, uh, simpler. Um, but you can also play the digital version of the game, which manages a lot of these rules for you. You don't have to manage any of these physical components. Um, you know, it's all online. You can play it like without uh, worrying about the uh, uh, the physical components or the fact that you have to organize friends to play it. <laughs> anyway, so we have uh, this sort of spectrum where we see the fully analog Gloomhaven on one side and the fully digital uh, adaptation uh, on the other side. Um, but what's going on in the middle here? Because there are things that uh, that that are happening. Uh, we see uh, this is a screenshot of Esoteric Software's Gloomhaven Helper, which is a companion app you can use with the game in order to manage some of the enemy movement uh, and their stats and that sort of thing. Um, and you can also play this game on Tabletop Simulator, which is a fully digital game, um, but it's not quite uh, the full adaptation. We can see this is, uh, we've taken the components. It still looks like the physical board game. Tabletop Simulator is trying to make, uh, simulate the experience of actually being at the table playing the game. Um, so uh, in between here, we have these other weird artifacts, like where, what, or games, how do we, how do we place these? Um, so I was looking at like existing frameworks, how like have other people theorized this sort of space um, and how can we apply that to this? So uh, Jesper Ewell in 2003 was trying to do a transmedia uh, framework that, you know, try to make a universal connection between physical games and digital games. So he's talking about, okay, there's the game state, uh, which in physical games is stored in the locations of the physical components um, and in digital games is stored in the hard drive of the computer or in RAM. Um, and there's also a uh, computation, uh, which is uh, the way that the rules of the game are enforced. So in physical games, the humans uh, enforce the rules themselves. And in a digital game uh, version of that game, uh, the computer, uh, these rules have been uh, put into Boolean logic and the computer is enforcing the rules um, in that case. So a, uh, an adaptation of this, uh, well, okay, using this, we would take the in-log game state and we would store it not in the pieces, uh, but in the computer uh, data and we would enforce the rules uh, using uh, the digital um, uh, computer. So, um, and another framework that comes to a very similar conclusion is Gorbarjik and uh, Orseth's uh, 2019 presentation, or sorry, paper on uh, ports and conversions in games. Uh, many of this part, you know, it's very focused on video games. So not all of it is um, uh, necessarily fitting, but uh, specifically they talk about game adaptations, the uh, taking a digital game and making it into a physical game. And they're saying that, okay, what you're transferring is the presentation layer and the mechanics layer of those games. Uh, the presentation layer is the components uh, in the board game. So in this case, uh, if we were taking a board game and making it digital, we take those components, we make them digital. Um, and uh, the mechanics uh, is almost exactly the same. We take the rules uh, as Yule's framework. We take the rules and we take them from being enforced by humans and give, hand them off to the computer. Um, so in their case, we take the analog presentation, make it digital. The analog mechanics make them digital, um, and so I think this is an, these, these frameworks are sufficient for examining this digital, fully digital version of of, of Gloomhaven. It does exactly that, um, and they have this sort of agreement that there is the, this sort of importance to the components and importance to the rules of the game, and somehow we transfer those uh, into a new medium. Um, but I, I find that these frameworks are not sufficient uh, for understanding uh, these sorts of spaces here. Uh, we can see, okay, my first uh, idea was, okay, I'll take Yule's framework and I'll say traditional board games are analog game state and, uh, comp and analog computation. And digital board games are digital uh, game state, digital computation. Um, but uh, we have Gloomhaven Helper and let's think about this. Okay, that could maybe fit in this quadrant. We have analog game state. We're still using the physical board game, uh, but the app is doing some of this rule of computation for us. Um, and we can also, you know, okay, tabletop sim, uh, we have now fully digital components, but you can set up a game in tabletop sim where the players uh, have to um, enforce all the rules. Uh, but these, I think these frameworks are insufficient. They don't adequately include these hybrid games because uh, the way that I framed it is a sort of binary sense. We have uh, 
uh, we have, you know, you're either fully analog or you're fully digital um, in those uh, those things. And really, these games, uh, you know, when you play with the app, we have some digital components and some digital or some physical components. Um, and we have some human and some digital computation in the tabletop sim version. So, but I do agree that there is this sort of importance to the components and the rules. Um, and I was doing a research project on escape rooms, trying to understand uh, how escape games exist across mediums. And I was looking at the objects, um, how the different ways that the objects are mediated in the different uh, uh, mediums. So I was, uh, I was looking for something that might fit that. Um, so I was looking at uh, Noah Wardrop Fruin's operational logics, which splits mechanics or logics into communicative roles and abstract processes, which maps extremely well to uh, these other element uh, frameworks. Um, but the key point is that operational logics exist at the level of the mechanic, not the entire game. So I'm able to break down, uh, rather than this thing being fully digital or fully analog on these, uh, these sort of axes, um, we can split it such that specific rules and specific components are made digital. So the movement rules, for example, in Gloomhaven handled in the digital adaptation, uh, re reference these rules about movement and refer to the what the piece that you do move uh, in that. So the question is not, are the objects and rules made digital in these, in these sort of hybrid games, but specifically which objects and which rules are made digital, um, which is a frame, uh, a perspective that uh, operational logics affords us. So looking at the process from taking from an analog game to a digital game, um, I, I separate this into three sub processes. We, uh, one is mediation. We take the physical objects of the game and we turn them into digital objects. So uh, rather than the physical components, we get 3D models, we get sprites. Um, and uh, codification is the process of taking the rules of the game uh, written out in the rule book uh, and taking those and putting them into a digital form, into a, a way that the computer can understand and enforce. And then finally, uh, in order to support codification, we have digitization, which is taking the game state of the game and making it computer readable, allowing the computer to understand where, where in the game are we at so that it can actually enforce the rules. So uh, for example, the ticket to ride physical game is, is not mediated in the sense that I'm talking about. There's no digital objects. Um, the, the computer doesn't understand this um, and the, uh, the rules are not codified versus Ticket to Ride on PC, the Steam version, uh, we have mediated components. Uh, the computer understands the current state of the game and thus is able to enforce the rules of the game. Um, and each of these axes can be done partially or with some of the rules and some of the components. Um, and that's what we're seeing in the hybrid space. Um, and I think there's considerations on each of these that kind of informs uh, the ways in which we do adaptations uh, that are different, not in a quantitative sense, but in a qualitative sense. So uh, the ways in which the components are mediated affects the sort of um, gameplay we have here. So the way that they've mediated uh, the uh, they've mediated some of the components in the Gloomhaven Helper app, which shows that uh, you don't need any of these physical components from the component sheet when you're playing with the Gloomhaven Helper. Um, it makes those completely uh, redundant um, and easier to work with. Um, but the way in which we mediate those components is also important. We can see in this case, they are represented by just 2D images. Uh, in Tabletop Sim, they are faithful recreations of the physical components of the game. Um, and Gloomhaven uh, on PC goes all the way uh, to the other end of the spectrum and presents as very traditional video gaming. We see um, you know, 3D models, animations, uh, health bars, that sort of thing. Um, and the way in which we mediate also can affect which kinds of games we can play on the platforms we choose. So on Tabletop Simulator, uh, these objects are enabled with physics. So you can play something like Jenga on Tabletop Sim. You can't imagine playing that on something like Vassal Engine, uh, which was designed for war games, something uh, where you only have 2D representations of the objects. Um, and in terms of digitization and codification, um, I, I want to drive home that digitization does enable this sort of codification um, where, uh, we cannot enforce these rules without um, the, the computer understanding what's going on. So uh, we see on the spectrum, we, we move slowly to more digitization, more codification as we get further on. We're enforcing more of the rules for the player. Um, and we can see this is uh, being applied to other projects uh, in the physical space. So we can apply digitization and codification without mediation. Um, in a project like False Profits by Mandrake at all 2002, they were uh, making a sort of tabletop game uh, that uses sensors in order to expose the rules to the, pl uh, to, oh, sorry, expose the game state to the computer so that it can enforce rules like what can you see right now? 
We can see the same sort of thing following up in uh, CMON Games' Teberu uh, project they announced uh, in which they are trying to enable physical games to have uh, exposed like their locations, uh, what you rolled on the dice to the computer. Um, but I think there's also this sort of competing desire to maintain the importance, maintain the importance of the physical components. So we can see uh, in a game, Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth by Fantasy Flight Games. Um, this is a really interesting game that is, you must play it with an app. So it's a physical board game that has a hybrid uh, component and that which you must use the, uh, the mobile app. Um, and we can see the components of the game are partially mediated, partially digitized and partially codified. We can see uh, in this game, you play with the physical board and then that board is recreated in the digital space um, in order to enforce which rules uh, the computer knows about and which ones it doesn't. So the computer uh, is handling things like, where are the enemies? Oh, not where are the enemies, sorry, but what are the enemies' health bars, um, that sort of thing. But the computer is specifically not um, given the information of where the enemies are, where are the players? Those sorts of things are managed entirely by the, by the people. So they've sort of split this uh, sort of thing in order to maintain uh, the importance of the physical game and uh, instead of going all the way and making this uh, just a video game. So um, as we can see what's happening here. This is in the physical version. Uh, we can see the components and those are not present in the digital version of the game. They specifically have not digitized that information. So uh, to close about Gloomhaven, um, I think there is, you know, I think there is a desire for heavy games where you do have a lot of fiddly bits and you do have uh, this sort of hard compo or sorry, hard rules to understand. And we can see, um, you know, it's a heavyweight game, but it's ranked number one on Board Game Geek right now. Frosthaven, the sequel uh, is probably, I think the highest rate, uh, highest uh, raising board game on Kickstarter with almost $13 million. Um, and, but uh, in order to fill the gaps for people who do not want those sort of bits, but still want to play the game, uh, they, they have options in between and all the way on the other fully digital end of the spectrum. Uh, in order to fit your desire of rules complexity and uh, fiddly bits. So thank you very much. That's all I got. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you, Merrick. Um, so the next presenter we have is uh, Paul Booth. Um, uh, Paul is a professor of communication at DePaul University. He's the editor and author of 14 books, and I won't list them all, but I will list a few right now. Uh, the Excellent Board Games as Media, which is out on Boomsbury uh, right now, Get It While It's Hot. The Fan is Primer with Rebecca Williams, uh, forthcoming, Watching Doctor Who, uh, The Wily Companion to Media Fandom and Fan Studies, Seeing Fans, Controversies and Digital Ethics, um, uh, Digital Fandom 2.0, Playing Fans, Gameplay and Fan Phenomena, Doctor Who. Um, and it says on his bio that he's currently enjoying a cup of coffee and no, it's a cup of water right now. So unfortunately, um, uh, uh, Paul will not be as caffeinated as he could be. Anyways, um, Paul is going to talk to us now um, about analog apps, board games, and digital play. So take it away, Paul. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm, uh, I'm really sorry for disappointing all of the coffee fanatics out there. Um, I actually finished my coffee pot earlier this morning uh, and didn't make a new pot because I was so enthralled by the keynote that uh, I didn't get up to make another pot. Um, uh, so thank you so much for inviting, uh, for, for having me and uh, uh, listening to my talk about analog apps. It's actually going to dovetail really nicely with what Melissa was talking about in uh, the earlier presentation. Um, uh, especially because uh, she mentioned, uh, or rather they mentioned their article, Unpacking Board Games with Apps, uh, which um, I integrate a little bit into what I'm talking about here. Um, so uh, let me get started. Let me just open up the chat just in case things pop up. Okay. Um, cool. Excellent. Um, so uh, as Aaron mentioned, um, I, uh, I recently published a book called Board Games as Media, uh, where I looked at board games as, as media products. What are they communicating about uh, the, the world that we live in? What if we analyzed games as if they were TV or film or things like that? Um, and one of the things that I kind of researched but didn't have room to put into the book uh, was kind of board games that used digital apps as uh, a way of facilitating play. 
Um, and I was really intrigued by this idea. And um, I haven't, I haven't, I, it just, it didn't fit into the book. So I've been kind of toying with what to do with it. Um, and this presentation is a little bit of that playing around to kind of see uh, where I might go with it. But it's really based on actually an, an article that Aaron uh, published uh, in Analog Game Studies uh, about the interaction between the digital and the analog, where he's uh, kind of wrote, although often posited as opposites, the analog and the digital are intimately related in the board game hobby. Um, and um, he was writing about, you know, the way that digital is part of the design process, the production process, and then in the gameplay uh, itself. Um, I'm kind of interested in a, in a more philosophical idea, I guess, which is, you know, philosophically, what does bringing the digital into our analog play um, do? How does that change the experience? How does that change the, the way that we interact? Um, and so the, the main uh, kind of thrust of my argument in this talk is that um, the material elements of gameplay um, are kind of the physical objects on the game on, on the game board, but the digital kind of interrupts that immaterial gameplay experience. Um, and in that respect, the digital is actually doing what the digital has always done, uh, which is facilitate a kind of immateriality as seen in opposition to the material, analog, physical, real world, quote unquote. And so um, that's where I'm really coming from here, um, that board games exist, a, a board game play experience exists between those kind of material elements of the board game itself with this immaterial experience of play and the digitation of, an app, of, a, of a digital app that's integrated into the game highlights that kind of immateriality. And so one of the things that I did for uh, this presentation is I looked a little bit at the history of digital and what does it mean uh, philosophically and in a media kind of studies sense of what, digital, what digitality is, what is the digital. Um, and there's a great piece by Benjamin Peters where he talks about the digital always in contrast to the analog, that it is, it is the digital only exists because the analog is there as a contrast to it. It's a kind of paradigmatic um, opposition. And in that sense, the digital is always referencing something else. It's referencing the symbolic, it's indexing the real, and it's manipulating uh, this kind of our understanding of the physical world. The digital is not a thing, it is a representation of a thing. So how does that play a role in the physical games that we're playing, the material games that we're playing? Um, I realized that in order to investigate this, um, I really had to look at two different things. I had to look at the textual analysis of a game. That is, what is the game actually doing? What is the game actually looking like? What are the textual elements of a game? Um, and then how do, how do players themselves interpret uh, the digital apps that they're playing with? Um, are digital apps part of this physical manifestation of the game? I mean, we're all sitting there. If you're playing a game that's using your phone, you're sitting there with a physical object in your hand, but manipulating the digital imaginary within it. Or does it exist as a kind of intangible experience of play itself? And so I find that there's, there's this interesting tension that happens. So I actually, as part of the research for board games as media, I interviewed about a thousand board game players, uh, or rather I should say I surveyed about a thousand board game players in interview. I'd simply doing the interviews if I interviewed them. Um, and uh, and I, I kind of put uh, uh, Melissa, Lucy and Martin's article up here because um, in, in their article, they talked about kind of working on, they, they also surveyed a bunch of uh, uh, board gamers um, so there's kind of a, a, a synergy going on here. <laughs> um, and what I found was uh, player responses were super mixed about whether they liked using digital apps within gameplay. And you can see on the chart here, um, m the most people were kind of in the middle. They didn't like it or dislike it. Maybe a little skewed towards we like it um, and a little bit less towards we don't like it. Um, but yeah, and by and large, people didn't really have to have strong feelings about it. Um, I've presented some of this research before, and um, in that presentation, I was asked to do a kind of more specific gender breakdown of that, and um, I did. And it, it's actually really interesting. Um, men tended to be much more polarized than women did. Uh, women tended to be more neither like nor dislike. Uh, men 
really disliked it or really liked it um, in, in, uh, in that kind of breakdown. Um, and it fits uh, with, within the survey, about 40% of the people that took the survey were women, um, and, but more women were more indifferent, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and then uh, some of the comments I got when I was asking questions, um, you know, people that um, didn't like using digital apps in their board game, board gaming, it was contrary to why they pl played board games, it's gimmicky, tethers you to the phone, um, they wanted board games to be analog, not digital. Um, I mean, this is picking and choosing some, some choice comments, um, but by and large, uh, people that did not like board uh, using digital apps in their board games was because they felt that it interrupted the flow of that analog experience. They wanted to become immersed to kind of reference back to Scott's excellent keynote earlier this morning. Um, they wanted to be immersed uh, and the app kept pulling them out of it. Um, uh, contrarily, people that liked having digital apps liked that it could take care of the fiddly bits. Um, it added something to the game if it could be used correctly. Um, it, uh, it added a good aspect to the game. It's fun, accessible, and familiar. Um, just a side note, I see in the chat, uh, and I want to want to preface that someone did say no other genders surveyed. Um, I did have an other uh, um, or um, non-binary category in that, um, but very, very few people I self-identified using that. And it wasn't statistically significant in the report, uh, but I'd be happy to dig down into that research um, and offer kind of that information if you're interested. Um, but yeah, there, 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 there was an option for non-binary uh, players as well. Um, so what this kind of ultimately showed uh, and this is this is kind of looking at this a bit differently than Melissa, Lucy, and Martin's article, um, is that there were really three kinds of ways that digital apps could be integrated into board games. Uh, they could augment the game, it could be an optional content that wasn't necessary, um, or it could be fully integrated into the game. And the way that the app was uh, interacted with the board game content um, made a difference in terms of how people interpreted it. So let's talk about each of these really briefly. Um, a game like Sleeping Gods uses digital apps uh, to augment a game. There's a, it comes with an audio or one of the uh, levels of the Kickstarter, let it um, came with a uh, CD um, so that uh, you, or I think it was a Spotify playlist so that you could like play music while you were, while you're playing the game. Didn't wasn't a part of the game, but was optional content. Um, Alex, your question in the chat, play by separated by age, didn't make a difference. Weirdly, I thought that, that 18 to 25 year olds would much prefer digital content. It made absolutely no difference. There was no statistical significance to it whatsoever. Um, the optional content way that board games became uh, integrated into the game was like, if you were using the app to streamline something, so, um, you know, One Night Ultimate Werewolf uses an app. It doesn't have to, you could play it without uh, an app, but it really kind of streamlines things. Same with Alchemists, right? There is a way to play it without using any sort of uh, digital tech, but, you know, the, the app kind of streamlines it. And the third way that a board game or that digital apps were integrated into board games was in an integral way. They were integrated fully into it. You literally cannot play Chronicles of Crime, Mansions of Madness, or Unlock, or, or hundreds of others without using digital uh, technology, right? World of Yoho, uh, your smartphone is your ship. Um, it is a physical object that has a digital overlay that changes the, the state of the game, right? Um, and what I found in kind of digging into the research is that when apps streamlined, augmented, uh, or were optional, they kind of mirrored this immaterial aspect of play, or, or sorry, the, the material aspect of play. But when they automated something that was part of the game, um, or they were integrated into that kind of gameplay, it, be, it took the place of an immaterial aspect to the game. And the people that were tended to be positive about uh, using digital apps in games were referring to things like uh, the augmentations, the optional content, things that streamlined the game, but were not part of the game, were, not, were paratextually related. Whereas 
people that thought apps didn't work well saw in a very uh, saw it as a way that it ran counter to the play experience that replaced immaterial aspects of the gameplay. So if this is the case, um, then if uh, board games as existing as both text and experience as a material and an immaterial, when a digital app legitimizes the immaterial reality of gameplay, then it's taking the place of the imagination of the game players, in which case it's uh, uh, perceived to be less effective. It's perceived to be interrupting uh, the gameplay, making things less immersive. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the contrast to that, when uh, a digital app was streamlining games, it was replacing aspects of the game um, that were not part of the imaginary experience, that were not part of what people enjoyed about playing games. Um, whether we like it or not, digital apps are here to stay. Uh, there's plenty of reasons for that. We can dig down to it in the chat uh, uh, if you wanted. Um, some of the things I, you know, new games are always coming out. So there's always needs to be new mechanics. There's always new players. So trying to get more people involved means more experimentation. Um, analog games tend to be more participatory than uh, they are interactive, meaning you participate with other players. So um, digital is one way to, to try and facilitate that. But at the same time, we've always had this sort of immaterial replacement in board games. Going back into the past, we've had VHS board games, DVD board games, electronic board games. Uh, for 100 years, we've had board games that used electric or electronic components. So this isn't anything new. And in some ways, the digital and the analog, the digital as an immaterial experience and the analog as a material experience are codependent within gameplay, regardless of whether we are using digital apps or not. Um, so I, I realize I kind of just skimmed the surface of a lot of topics here, and I'd love to talk about these more with you in chat. Um, or if you have other questions, feel free to email, uh, and my Twitter is up on the screen as well. Um, so thanks all. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, and last but not least, uh, we're, we're going to have uh, some uh, comments from uh, Jack Murray uh, with his essay, Are You a Planeswalker? Remediating Magic the Gathering. Um, Jack is a PhD student in the Text and Technology program at the University of Central Florida. He received his MA in Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communication with a focus on critical game studies from the University of Texas at Dallas. Jack's research focuses on the intersections between digital and analog games, narrative systems for games, and interactive fiction, and understanding technology through games and play. When not working on research game projects and day, uh, daydreaming about board games, Jack likes to race cards, sword fight, and lay on the floor with his dog, Kishka. Um, so welcome, Jack. I'm super excited to, to hear your work on Magic the Gathering, so go for it. All right, let me pull up my slides. Um, and just to note, your volume is slightly low if you can. Um, uh, all right, is this, is this any better? better? All right. Um, so as I, as I noted in, uh, in the Discord, I um, have been retooling my presentation on the fly a little bit. Um, because uh, Mirik uh, so kindly uh, covered a lot of what I uh, was originally planning on talking about um, with regards to uh, the kind of uh, computational aspects of, of analog games. Um, so thank you, uh, Aaron, for the introduction. Um, and for a brief land acknowledgement, I am presenting from Orlando, Florida. Uh, on uh, which is uh, located on the traditional land of the unconquered Seminole people. Um, this presentation is specifically going to be about uh, the weird ways that people have attempted to adapt Magic the Gathering uh, and more broadly um, about how... Sorry, I am having some technical difficulties. There we go. Uh, and more broadly about how we approach the question of adapting and remediating analog game platforms into digital platforms. 
Um, so to do this, uh, we'll be constructing a diagram that allows us to map different strategies for creating digital adaptations. And this is going to look, as I mentioned, very similar to uh, Murek's analysis. Um, before I begin, however, I uh, want to note that you can view an accessible version of my slides uh, on my website by following the link uh, that I will post in the chat now. Uh, I've also posted in the Discord. Um, or you can scan the QR code, which will be available on all the slides going forward. Um, so I want to kind of begin with uh, what Magic the Gathering is, not just as a card game, but as an entire platform. Um, as a platform, it functions as an assemblage of material components, codified rules and procedures, as well as the social and cultural contexts. Um, all of these things have been gestured to by, uh, by the preceding presentations. Um, and so as a platform, it affords a wide variety of uh, related activities, ranging from playing games to creating art by altering cards to getting super deep into lore discussions about the Magic the Gathering universe. Uh, and so my question when approaching this research is uh, what happens when analog games are recreated in digital formats uh, and what kinds of experiences are preserved, lost, or changed? Um, because uh, of what Magic the Gathering is, uh, these two questions encompass a massive scope uh, that eventually I would like to explore. Uh, however, this presentation is mostly going to focus on two pieces of the puzzle, um, namely the interface of the game uh, and the theming of the game. Uh, so when I say uh, interface, I'm referring specifically to the practice of sitting down to play Magic the Gathering. This includes the cards, the playing surface, and even uh, the other players. Uh, Magic is a particularly interesting game to look at for a variety of reasons. Um, through playing the game to, uh, or during the play of the game, each uh, player plays cards uh, that contain specific instructions that describe how they impact the game uh, and how they function within the rules of the game. And each turn essentially has players writing a program to do uh, uh, that they work together in order to execute. Uh, Mirik's presentation does a great job in kind of describing how this works with things like Gloomhaven um, and how the analog components of this end up being digitized. So I'm going to refer everyone back to the uh, back to Mirik's presentation um, and I'm going to uh, kind of skip forward a little bit. Um, so this is where my framework uh, differentiates a, a little bit um, in the focus on the thematic and narrative elements of Magic the Gathering. Uh, for a long time, uh, the Magic the Gathering marketing material, box inserts and branding, uh, told the player, you are a planeswalker um, and invited players to imagine themselves within the world of Magic the Gathering. Uh, the framing device for each game is that players are planeswalkers, uh, a kind of wizard who draws upon the energy of the land to summon creatures, allies, and do various magic things. Uh, each game of magic is representative of a duel between two planeswalkers, and the decks represent the spells available to, uh, to each planeswalker. When a card is played, it becomes uh, an event within the narrative structure of the game. Uh, the, names on the, art, uh, the names and art on the card describe what events are happening in addition to stringing them together based on a variety of choices from the player. Additionally, theme is a guiding design principle for, for magic. Uh, the five color archetypes uh, and, the various uh, and their various combinations have their own set of thematic tendencies that play off of each other. And each set of cards is focused around an established theme uh, and their archetypes. Certain mechanics are associated with, uh, and uh, players are able to, able to and encouraged to build decks around these, these themes and archetypes. So when players engage with the narrative components of Magic the Gathering by aiming for flavor wins that are thematically uh, pleasing or by creating uh, combinations of cards that have strange implications based on their mechanical interactions, they're telling a story within the universe of Magic the Gathering. Uh, additionally, Wizards of the Coast, the publishers of Magic, invest a lot of effort in establishing the, this narrative world uh, with a series of transmedia endeavors, uh, such as the 70 plus books and graphic novels. Um, re more recently, Wizards has moved away from the You Are, the Planeswalk uh, you Are a Planeswalker framing um, to focus on Magic's own cast of more marketable characters uh, while keeping the framing device relatively intact. Um, earlier uh, during the keynote, Scott Nicholson talked uh, quite a bit about uh, immersion in analog games in his keynote. So if you missed it, I highly recommend watching uh, watching that when the, the video is available. 
Um, and Scott covers the concepts of immersion in way more depth than I have uh, time for here. Um, but within Magic the Gathering, uh, the thematic elements are an important and substantial part of the community and players who prefer this uh, prefer this part of the uh, of the game are often jokingly referred to as as Vorthos uh, based on a blog post from designer Mark Rosewater and this describes players who uh, tend towards creating decks uh, that have a strong thematic focus or spend time engaging with uh, the lore of Magic the Gathering. So returning to the question at hand, how is Magic the Gathering adapted to digital platforms? How do we describe the approaches in a way that highlights the decisions being made about what experiences are important? Uh, another way to approach some of the conclusions that Merrick reached earlier is through Bolter and Grusin's theory of remediation, uh, which is a process that describes uh, the representation of one medium with another as a process of cultural competition between or among technologies. Uh, that define themselves by borrowing from, paying homage to, uh, critiquing, and refashioning their predecessors. We might also think about it as a form of adaptation, which highlights a relationship between two objects, the original and the adaptation, and a relationship between those two things and the entire realm of objects uh, that press it upon them. Um, whoops, I have a duplicate slide here. Uh, okay, so... Uh, the process of remediation exists uh, on an axis um, that looks similar to the one uh, one Merrick had, except um, on one end I had I put hypermediacy and on the uh, and immediacy on the other end. Immediacy describes a tendency or desire for the interface of an object to completely disappear. It erases the gap between representation and the object is it is representing by seeking to mimic the uh, original media as closely as possible. Hypermediacy, on the other hand. Uh, acknowledges the representation and makes the differences more apparent, essentially leaning into the gap. Um, there have been numerous attempts at uh, creating ways to play Magic the Gathering online, um, starting originally with Magic uh, the Gathering online in 2002, which manages to mimic many of the aspects of, of the paper game. Um, while many still use MTGO, it has largely been supplanted uh, with the release of Magic the Gathering Arena in 2018. Excuse me which is an attempt to compete with Blizzard's Hearthstone for the mobile game market. Both Arena and Magic the Gathering Online are primarily interested in preserving the experience of sitting down across from your opponent and playing a game of Magic. Uh, however, the, uh, Arena takes advantage of the digital nature to abstract away a lot of the math and rule interpretation that is traditionally done by players. Um, so if we place, uh, so if we make a chart that has immediacy on one end and hypermediacy on the other, um, Magic the Gathering Online and Magic the Gathering Arena uh, tend towards the immediacy end of the spectrum, but still make apparent their, the, the idea that they're um, bound up in a, uh, in a digital platform. Um, other approaches for Magic, uh, playing Magic remotely, have been around for a while, but as part of the pandemic era, more of these platforms have started to emerge and gain popularity. And the specific one I want to talk about is called Spell Table. At its core, Spell Table is an extension of the age-old method of playing analog games over the internet by pointing a webcam at the play area. Uh, in this way, Spell Table aims to allow players to use their own cards and replicate the physicality of sitting down to play paper magic with their friends. What makes Spell Table an adaptation rather than just webcams over video chat is the way it aims to enhance the experience by adding utilities that make the game easier. Uh, Spell Table not only includes life and damage calculators, it also visually identifies cards and makes the information visible uh, within the client. Um, so uh, Arena and Spell Table are both interested in recreating a similar experience, the sitting down and playing Magic, but their approaches differ. Where Arena wants to create an entire self-contained platform that utilizes all of the advantages available to streamline play, Spell Table, on, uh, on the other hand, uh, places emphasis on the physicality and material materiality of Magic. Uh, the digital elements are there to facilitate playing the game, uh, and but spell table still ends up falling more towards the immediacy side of the thing. Uh, in contrast to spell table, uh, there's tabletop simulator, uh, which recreates the table in a digital space. In contrast to arena, spell table, uh, arena and spell table, ta uh, TTS isn't an explicit adaptation of Magic the Gathering. Rather, it's a platform that provides digital versions of components to recreate any number of games. Uh, with the optional aid of, of scripting. Uh, the goal of Tabletop Simulator isn't to make the process streamlined, 
though with effort it can be. Instead, it revels in the awkward clunkiness of the interface, despite its uh, gradual departure from the tropes of the simulator genre from the early uh, 2010s. Uh, it's possible to play magic in tabletop simulator. And as the name suggests, uh, however, as the name suggests, the focus of the experiences is on the tabletop and not necessarily on playing magic. Um, so on our chart, uh, tabletop simulator falls uh, decidedly more towards hypermediacy because although it tries to replicate the experience of playing magic in person, the interface highlights the mediating, mediating layer of the computer. Um, so here's where things start to get weird. And I've seen people mention uh, the Micropose version of Magic the Gathering. Um, so in 1997, before uh, Magic the Gathering Online, we get uh, Micropose's version of Magic the Gand Gathering, which uh, came bundled with Chandelar, which is an adventure RPG developed uh, by Micropose, where you play as a uh, planeswalker traveling through the world of magic, fighting monsters and exploring dungeons. And it's uh, instead of taking the narrativization of magic and simulating cards and spells that uh, our characters can cast, you literally play as the Planeswalker version of you. And then you sit down and you play magic with the enemies. The game goes so far as to simulate a community of magic players letting you buy, sell, and trade cards with non-player characters. Instead of being a pure replication of magic, Chandelar leans heavily into the thematic elements. As an adaptation that lets us play magic, uh, its interface is constrained by the affordances of computing at the time and relies heavily on the digital interface. Similar to Tabletop Simulator, Chandelar foregrounds its digital nature. Um, though unlike Tabletop Simulator, it has an additional goal of expanding upon the thematic experience of Magic the Gathering. To complicate things even further, um, Around the same time as Chandelar, Magic the Gathering Battle Mage was released by Acclaim. Battle Mage is a real-time strategy game set in the Magic universe. However, beyond theming and a passing nods to cards as kind of a clunky UI element, the gameplay holds no similarities to the card games. And in December 2019, uh, Cryptic Studios announced Magic Legends, an action RPG in the style of Diablo, which, like Battle, uh, Battle Mage, its primary focus was on the purely thematic elements of Magic, letting the players uh, play within the thematic world only with a cursory reference to the cards. Both of these games were not really received well, with Battle Mage being panned by critics and Legends being shut down three months after its official release. The primary reason these games failed was not necessarily because they focused on the thematic aspects of Magic, but rather because they were not particularly well made. Um, So to uh, account for these, um, I want to uh, start by turning towards uh, Cameron Kunzelman's description of effective versus subjective adaptations. Um, here, the effective experiences are interested in replicating the particular feelings of an object. Um, in uh, Kunzelman's example, the world of a, of a film. And the subjective experience, on the other hand, is to enforce a specific subject position on the player. Uh, for example, if uh, playing a film character in a game based on, on the film. However, uh, we cannot simply take uh, the subjective and effective and put them cleanly on opposite ends of the uh, opposite ends of the axis. When playing an analog game, we occupy multiple subject positions um, as a player playing the game and as a character acting within the thematic world of the game. Arena, tabletop simulator, and spell table all aim to adapt the player subject position with little thought to the thematic elements. Uh, what is it like to sit at a table and play magic, for example? Chandelar, on the other hand, draws in the thematic position first and the pl uh, player position second. Um, this also demonstrates another limitation when applying this framework to analog uh, to digital game, game adaptations. Um, broadly speaking, affect is a way of thinking about the inarticulable process of feeling. How do we feel? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, how do things influence how we feel? Aubrey Annable uh, uses affect to refer to the aspects of emotion, feeling, and bodily engagement that circulate through people and things, but are often registered only at the interface. The interface here is taken literally to mean the interface of an object, such as the touchscreen of a phone or a tablet that Annable bases uh, her analysis on. In this case, the interface describes how the mechanical elements of a game intercept with the thematic and how players come into contact with the system as a whole. Um, affect is specifically interested in the interrelations uh, and intensities uh, of interrelations. Uh, 
digital adaptations specifically mediate the effect of relationships that make up games as a platform. Um, uh oh. I'm Jack, sorry, I just um, have one more minute of time, if you can please wrap things up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and skip forward. Uh, so I've put it on a, uh, I've added a thematic and ludic axis. Um, so we're visiting our chart. We have the remediation axis that maps the trends towards immediacy and hypermediacy, as well as the our thematic and ludic axis, which I, I uh, call the effective axis because it describes uh, the feeling of what an ad adaptation is aiming for. So now we can map uh, different approaches uh, to magic based, adapting magic based on what kind of feeling they're going for. Um, and so I want to end with a few uh, questions, uh, or end with a conclusion. So when looking at digital adaptations of Magic the Gathering, there are a variety of approaches. Uh, and the chart we've constructed along the way allows us to map the ways digital uh, adaptations approach the effective dimensions of the game um, that, uh, that is, does this feel like sitting down and playing magic or does this feel like engaging with the broader, broader thematic world of, of Magic the Gathering? Uh, and the way adaptations approach the interfaces of, ma uh, of magic is an attempt to make the game seamlessly appear to be paper magic or does it foreground the way the transition to digital alters the way players interact with the game? So to wrap up, when approaching a digital adaptation of an analog game, it is important to consider what experiences are important, which ones get preserved, which ones are lost and which ones are changed, as well as what kind of experience does the change privilege? Uh, and I think these are important questions for uh, scholars and designers uh, to just uh, think about. Um, and that is that. Thank you very much. Thank you all for such wonderful panels, uh, uh, presentations, and for uh, a, a bunch of uh, things that I think really wound up in conversation. Uh, with one another. Um, there's one or two questions in the chat, but I wanted to kind of uh, uh, recount some of the notes I took while um, listening, uh, because I think it dovetails nicely with one of the questions. So um, I, there are a lot of binaries being constructed in all of these panels. The ones I noticed, um, I think Paul had fantasy and materiality was an interesting one. Um, digital and analog, we kind of set up with the panel title. So that's one of the ones that's there. And then there's hypermediacy and uh, immediacy, and then Chloe Germain, and this is moving into her question, um, asks, uh, can you respond to the challenge that if she doesn't buy the binary that the digital is immaterial and the analog is material, the thing itself? Um, uh, Can, can you respond to that? Uh, what would you say to somebody who doesn't agree that analog is necessarily material and digital is necessarily immaterial? I hope I'm getting that question right, Chloe. Um, if, if I'm not, please put in the chat some more clarification, but let, let's start with that question for all the panelists. So if I can kind of begin, uh, I, I agree with you, Chloe. Um, I don't necessarily buy the immaterial material split. Um, it's, but it's an easy thing to fall back on. Um, and I don't know if we necessarily, I, def I definitely ran, uh, ran out of time during my presentation. So I uh, don't really, uh, didn't really have a lot of time to um, kind of dig into this, but I think it's a very important question moving forward, especially as um, the, the analog and, uh, and digital uh, aspects of, of gaming kind of blend together. Yeah, I'll um, uh, just adding on to that. I I agree. I I I I try and uh, escape binaries wherever I can, but um, as a shorthand, I think they're they they have a place. Um, so I I agree. I don't think it's I don't think it's absolute, and I don't I don't think you know you can make a direct tie. Analog is material, digital is immaterial. Um, but I think that the the given that the term digital is itself set up in opposition to the analog, um, it has it, it has already been constructed to be binaristic like that. Um, so I would I, I definitely encourage us to push against that. Um, but but in the kind of 15 minute presentation, um, it feels like it was a it was a good shorthand for me. Um, and the other the other thing I'll add is I think that perceptually, 
when you're playing with a digital app, at least within a game, you, you, you have a physical material object that contains animation or contains some aspect that is digitally created that is quite literally intangible. Um, and, and I guess maybe that's, that's what I was meaning when I was using the phrase, um, but, but your point is well taken. Merrick, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I, get, I mean, I think about, I mean, one, one thing I think about is like the fact that the Magnavox Odyssey um, is an analog platform. I mean, it runs on like, there's no, uh, you know, logic gates, like it's not, it's not a computer. Um, so I think like, we have that's immaterial in the sense that we've been using it, um, but is running on uh, analog in the sense that it's not, it's not digital. Another thing I think about is, yeah, is like the, through my, my, my mediation thing is like, uh, like the recreation of these objects in the digital space um, and like uh, the different affordances those objects have um, that maybe are not or are trying to capture something that the physical object has or what maybe are not. So like uh, if we if we take the little miniature in Gloomhaven and we took that into a 3D uh, model and it now it has animation and it whacks things and like that's so like I feel like we moved beyond uh, this sort of uh, transfer at that point. But yeah, I think it's a uh, I, I think it's a good question. I, um, and yeah, I, my, my, my framework is very binaristic. So um, yeah, good point. Thank you. Can, can you just, just for those in the audience who aren't that um, familiar with the Magnavox Odyssey, can you clarify to everybody how that yeah, works? Yeah, so the Magnavox Odyssey, um, this is something that uh, my, my grad advisor, uh, Nathan Altice was really into. Um, it was like, uh, it's, it's like, it's circuitry. Um, and it's all like, it, it's just, uh, but it's not circuitry in like the, the sort of sense we think of it now. Like it's not, it's not put into a sort of computerized language or zeros and ones. It's all like, it's powered like through just like electronic circuits um, that like more, um, <laughs> and like what you do, like the actual game cartridges are not storing any sort of data. It's just like, con they just have like little uh, connectors and you put it in there. It's all, it's hard coded uh, into the actual like uh, circuitry. It's, it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. I'm just reading out Chloe's response to you all. Uh, that, those were great answers. Thanks everybody for the considered answers. It's very complicated because a lot of these binaries emerge from the very pervasive re representational fallacy that shapes our worldview here in the West, minority world, and our temptation to see the digital as virtue and ignore its material, economic, and ecological consequences in the world. Um, uh, and just for a note for everybody else in the audience, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A. We will we'll get to them. Um, okay, moving back into the Q&A, um, the first question now uh, is from Amanda Panda. Uh, and I think this is a lighter question. Any thoughts why bots for solo play or to make three-player um, games work with two players aren't digitized more? Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think my my immediate thought there um, goes back to what Chloe was asking about, um, which is the kind of physical manifestation of the digital object. Um, it's it's expensive to include digital components in a game, and so using like bringing in one for uh, um, in an Otama player or something may not just be worth the cost. Um, it, just on a purely practical level um, would be kind of my my initial thought on that. I think there is, you know, uh, some pushback against the digital as, as Paul talked about, like this sort of uh, not a lack of interest in bringing that in. Um, so it's interesting, like the different uh, ways that people handle this, like Pax Premier second edition, it's like a little deck of cards, you know, and you, you flip it and it tells you like what the AI player does. There's all these different approaches to that that are physical. Um, uh, and, you know, there's like uh, the, the, what are they called? Um, uh, like Cuba Libre, whatever that series is called, the coin games. Uh, those use like um, like flow charts and stuff like that. Um, that are you know, it's harder to manage, um, but maybe that's of interest to some people. They'd rather um, do that sort of thing uh, than have to deal with the app. Um, that may might make it easier. Great questions, and um, here's one for Jack. Um, Dominic Holtz noticed that the immediacy thematic quadrant was blank. Is that non accidental? What would such an adaptation mean, um, i.e. might any digital adaptation uh, necessarily move away from immediacy? And can you put up the quadrant so everybody can see yes. um, what you're responding to here? Yes, okay. Can everyone see that? 
Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's something that, that um, I wanted to touch on, but uh, uh, I'm bad at timing out presentations. Um, so yeah, so as you, as you um, see the, there's a trend towards like less and less uh, things that look less and less like magic, the gathering as we move uh, more towards the thematic uh, hyper mediated versions of, of, of the games. Um, and uh, this, th so this chart, this mapping is something that I'm still working through. It's something in progress and it's something that I'm going to be uh, fighting with uh, during my, while writing my dissertation. Um, but I was thinking through something like, um, if you remember the, the board game that was uh, Magic the Gathering Arena of the Planeswalkers, um, which uh, does a thematic, uh, or it, it's, it's a more thematic version of, uh, or it's 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 basically a uh, tabletop war game based around um, Magic: The Gathering, um, and so that is definitely like high on the thematic element um, and leans into the 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 kind of analog um, interface. And then there's also these uh, mini games they uh, they put out. Um, I'm drawing a blank. I think one of them was. Um, like the, if you remember the planeswalk boxes that basically have like a little board in between that, that um, change the kind of the goal of the game. So it's less about like damaging opponents, life totals, and more about um, interacting with this, this central board. Um, and I think that is something that could be uh, up in that quadrant, but you're right. It's, it's um, uh, the more something, uh, the more an adaptation tends to focus on the digital elements um, we get uh, more, uh, hyper mediated. Um, and all, and yeah, and that's a, a, also something that, um, like complicates the idea of like remediation, like is, is it possible to have a, a version of, of something that is a digital remediation of a thing or does it ne is it necessarily, um, a digital thing or is remediation necessarily a digital process? Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, I'm planning on digging more into going forward. That's a great answer. Um, so we have about 10 more minutes for questions, but no more questions in the queue at the moment. So if anybody has a question, please put it in there. Uh, but while you all are thinking, I, I have a question um, for the room. And I, I guess uh, my question is, uh, given that uh, Melissa, John, and Lucy's talk came before yours, but they're not here right now, I actually think there's a lot of overlap there between their talks and the, the way that you all are presenting these theorizations of the digital and theorizations of the analog. So I guess um, how, I would ask, do you think that the magic circle is useful to your work? So or is it at all, if it is at all? I'm going to be, be upfront and admit that like, I am not a fan of the magic circle. Um, there's uh, you know a long history of it, like doing a lot of harm in uh, games, uh, gaming discourse. And I'm not necessarily sure it's a thing that necessarily needs to be um, resuscitated. Um, and I think their talk did a great job of like ex uh, expanding what it means to be within the magic circle. Um, but I still think it leaves out a lot of these kind of like paratextual moments of, uh, that um, are part of the experience of playing a game. So like in magic, you have, uh, you know, going to a store and talking to the other players and, you know, buying and selling cards and these secondary marketplaces that pop up. Um, and I think that's all an important part of playing the game that you can't separate from like the, the platform that is magic, the gathering. Um, and in the same way, uh, that the magic circle gets invoked a lot to say, hey, this is just a game, like let's keep politics out of it. That's not something that uh, is available to everyone, especially when you have um, issues around um, tr uh, anti-trans uh, reactionary engagement with um, like artists in Magic the Gathering um, or, uh, you know, the uh, ongoing gatekeeping and targeting of, of women and people of color in, in these communities. Um, so I'm not necessarily sure that like, well, to, to sum up, I am, I am anti magic, anti magic circle. I think that's a, a great examples also from magic the gathering that you brought in there. Uh, Paul and Merrick, any thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with what Jack said. Um, it is specifically, I think, but I, I think the magic circle is a is maybe a bit dated, but is also a a heuristic that people still use. 
right? Whether whether we like it or not. Um, and so I think about the inter the, the survey I did uh, and the people I talked to about why they did or didn't like digital apps. And so much of it was about being taken out of that experience, being taken out of the game. Um, and they didn't use the term magic circle, but that's what they were talking about. So I, I agree with you that it is like, we don't need to talk about it anymore. It's been talked about, there's, there's, it has led to more problems uh, than it's worth, um, but it is still a concept that people use in gameplay, uh, whether they know it or not. Eric? Yeah, I'm so, I, I was just so taken by uh, Jack and Paul's answers. I don't, I don't know if I have anything um, particularly uh, novel to, to add that. Um, good points, thank you. Oh, ex excellent stuff all around. Um, uh, are there any, we have, I think, time for one final question. Does anybody have one final question maybe put into the chat or the Q&A? Um, when I teach classes, I'm a big fan of awkward silence and I am very happy to just sit for like five minutes and wait till something emerges because uh, often people's brains are in uh, other spaces. But yeah, one more question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some awkward silence right now as we all wait for it. See, Ian Bellamy is baking a question right now. It's going to take some time. Um, Mike Deanda, okay. Uh, Mike Deanda asks about uh, Peter McDonald's work that argues for a phenomenological analysis of Hutzinger's work to see where we have a play spirit versus empirical or heuristic understanding of Hutzinger's play. Um, Mike, do you mind if I try to find a way to allow you to communicate your question uh, with words? Because I feel like I'm not going to get the spirit of what you're asking there. Um, and I'd love it if you would um, uh, uh, explain it a little better in that way. Oh, there we go. Allowed to talk. Hello? Yes, we can hear oh, you. You put me on the spot. Um, it was more of a provocation for the uh, conversation that was going on, but Peter McDonald um, has talked about um, Huizinga's work and looking at it not in terms of check, like a checklist that we have to have uh, X, Y, Z for play, the play spirit to arise, but thinking about it as a phenomenological uh, occurrence that when when these components of play, as Huizinga defines, um, happen together, that they're operating together, that's when the play spirit arises in these various uh, situations. Um, and, and he's kind of tracing the um, historiography of how Huizinga has been interpreted and used um, and pushing back against this like um, way that game studies and ludology has um, codified Huizinga into an empirical or a heuristic use of this definition. Does that make sense? It was also just a provocation. I'm, I'm happy to hear the, or um, send the article that I'm talking about out to people on the Discord. Uh, yeah, if you could post that in Discord, that'd be great. Um, I think that like taking a phenomenological approach towards um, things like the play spirit is really what like the rest of Hoisinga's book that you know the parts that we don't always cite in game studies is kind of about um, and I think uh, that's you know I think you're, you're exactly right and that there are like other ways to engage uh, engage with it for example I really like um, the Terra Fickles um, kind of di uh, colonial discourse analysis on uh, on the magic circle that's in um, the race card. Uh, and I think it's um, Amanda Phillips's uh, Gamer Trouble um, has a chapter um, that also tackles um, some of the ways people uh, engage with uh, things like the magic circle. Um, for me, I've kind of turned to the, uh, the effective dimension. Like, what does it feel like to play a game? Um, what is... Uh, like what are these kind of uh, relational uh, relational experiences? And for uh, to that extent, I've been drawing a lot on um, things like um, queer phenomenology and 
um, and the, the work of, of uh, you know, queer and feminist af uh, affect scholars to kind of des uh, f describe and figure out like how um, we become oriented towards play uh, through the, the kind of assemblages that, that um, play and games are enmeshed in. Hopefully that kind of answers. Final thoughts, Paul or Merrick? Thank you, Jack. I haven't read the McDonald piece, so I'm looking forward to seeing it in the Discord. Um, mm -hmm. But I I love Jack's answer, and I'm happy to to put a thumbs up on it. <laughs> well, this was a wonderful panel, and thank you all for such a thought provoking and excellent conversation. Um, coming up next, I gotta get my schedule out. Is a break, um, and then we're gonna uh, have a nice panel about play communities and practices, which is sure to be excellent. So. Uh, please stick around. The next panel starts at um, 4 p.m. Eastern time. See you all soon.